I welcome you all to this webinar arranged by Fixed Point Theory and Precaution Group here at KFUPM. Uh, this is a bi-weekly seminar and we hold it as a webinar and as a seminar. So you are all welcome to this webinar of today. Today our speaker is Professor Muhammad Amin Khamsi. Uh, he will talk about introduction to variable exponent spaces and discuss some results. So please, Professor Muhammad Amin Khamsi, please <coughs> present your talk. Uh, okay. Um, so first of all, um, I want to welcome everyone. Uh, we have a good uh, attendance. Um, I want just to say something very interesting is that, uh, which happened to me a few hours ago, uh, as you can see, this is organized by the fixed point theory and the applications research seminar, research group seminar at KFUPM. And uh, earlier, my son Bilal was asking me uh, uh, something, and they said, uh, uh, My mind is with my talk tonight uh, for this seminar. And, and he said, Oh, okay, so you will be talking about fixed point. And I said, uh, in fact, funny, because I didn't even think about it, that uh, in this talk, you are not going to hear the word fixed point. It's only in the title on the first slide. There is absolutely nothing about fixed point, which is really funny, because uh, my name now is associated every time I give a talk that I'll be talking about fixed point theory and fixed points. But in this, uh, in this talk, at least, uh, uh, I will not be talking about fixed point. Uh, there is a second part of it uh, where we prove some fixed point theorems. But right now, what I'm going to be doing tonight, or at least in this talk, uh, is to talk about something that is fairly recent. Okay, So uh, you have in the title an introduction to variable exponent spaces. Uh, of course, there are some people in the attendance and some people who do know about variable exponent spaces. So I came to, 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 to meet these spaces by pure accident, uh, by reading some articles in the book and uh, about history of Banach spaces. A beautiful book, by the way. And I saw something that really, wow, was an eye-opener for me. So let, let, let's, let's get going. First of all, let's see a motivation to these variable exponent spaces. These variable exponent spaces, as you will see uh, later on, they go back to uh, early 30s, 1931, 1932, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, there was uh, an uptick around 1950, and but in the recent years, uh, it's amazing. What, what they are doing is unbelievable. So what I'm going to do is start with the motivation before I go into the theory, let me start with the motivation first, okay? Uh, some science fiction, basically. Huh? So, uh, so uh, this, uh, what we will be talking about, the motivation is what's known as the electrorheological fluids or ER fluids, okay? So what's interesting about these fluids is um, <clears throat> that they have a, a physical property known as the Winslow effect. Uh, of course, it goes back to the um, American physicist, Willis Winslow, who uh, was the first one to notice this behavior of this kind of fluids. They are, they are smart fluids, and what they do is that their viscosity changes. In other words, uh, in the absence of uh, electrical, any electrical field, uh, the uh, the fluid behaves natural, but the moment you throw in an electrical field, this uh, uh, the fluid starts to change. But in a response time, is very very small, a few milliseconds, huh? in the order of mi few milliseconds, and uh, it becomes one hundred uh, thousand. This is the nat I'm talking about the normal ER fluids, huh? the ones that. Uh, were discovered in 1949, uh, and after that, of course, I'll say something about the 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 newer version of these fluids 
which is terrible. So this 100,000 times the viscosity now. In other words, uh, you can have something now that is st stronger. You see, uh, in a, f a few uh, milliseconds, you move from uh, a liquid type of viscosity to something that is strong. So and that's what they use, for example, uh, at the beginning it was more about brakes and shocks. Let me show you in the next slides about some applications of these ER fluids, okay? Oh, uh, here we are, the uh, giant electro uh, ER fluid. Uh, these are were discovered in 2003, and these are the ones that gives you even a higher yield. And it has some very amazing applications in the military, for example. You can imagine uh, protecting uh, it's, nothing will go through once you once you put an electrical field on. Nothing will go through these liquids. Nothing. I mean, I'm talking about bullets and whatever you want. Uh, so, uh, the point is that it has some major applications, whether it's in aerospace industry, uh, like for example here. Look at this one here. Uh, even Motorola was interested. So you have these hydraulic valves and clutches. This is the first one, of course. Uh, the old uh, ER fluids. But uh, you do have now, uh, of course, you have the brakes, the ER brakes, shock absorbers. And in recent years, uh, even in the uh, what they call flexible uh, electronics, like Motorola has patents using this kind of uh, uh, ER fluids uh, in their uh, mobile device. Okay? So uh, th the point is, okay, so uh, fine. Now... This is nice. This ER fluids or smart fluids are good, but what is special about them? Okay, why is it that you are starting with this motivation? How? Uh, so if you go to look at now the equation satisfied by this uh, uh, fluids are some nasty PDEs. Okay, a very terrible PDEs. Okay, so if you look at the Dirichlet energy integral that you see there. Uh, where du is the symmetric part of the gradient. Uh, of course, the gradient here, u is a, a vector, the velocity vector, uh, it's a point x, uh, and you have um, du, which is the gradient, so it's going to be a matrix, n by uh, n matrix, okay? And uh, what you take there is the symmetric part of that matrix, okay, which it's norm 2. Uh, and you have that power P of X, which depends on the electrical field at time T and the position X, okay? And uh, what's amazing is that it changes. So you see the, the, uh, uh, the power here that you see here uh, is the P of X is changing. It's not constant, okay? And it tells you that uh, you have function that you are, because you are taking the norm, so it's a real valued function, and you are integrating it over omega, which is an opposite of Rn, uh, and you have this uh, exponent, which is not constant. So uh, that's why we talk about variable exponent spaces, okay? So uh, here are the questions that the people struggled with. So some of the questions. Okay, what does it mean that this integral uh, is finite? So this energy is finite. Uh, what kind of space does F belong to? And what is the connection with the classical LP spaces? Where, of course, now P is constant. Okay, the classical LP spaces. Um, so these are the, the questions that uh, people ask, but what I want to, 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 to tell you is that the motivation is recent, uh, 1949, for example, okay? Uh, but the questions are older than that. They go back to Orlich and others. So, but the point is to, to put it in a way for you to motivate you to the introduction to these variable exponent spaces. This is how I thought about it. Instead of starting with the historical fact and starting with 1931, now I wanted to do it in a way that uh, we have a real life example from physics uh, with some major applications and uh, the PDE is associated to this uh,
problem in fact are oh i forgot to mention that one of the the most beautiful problem is very important i wanted to say it here is that uh, we look for u that minimizes the energy huh? so one of the what we call the dirichlet energy problem huh? you see this is the dirichlet energy integral but the dirichlet energy problem very famous for the people working in this area is the infimum of this over certain u okay which happens to be the u that will give you the minimum that will give you the minimum if any uh, it will be some solution to some uh, weird pdes with laplacian and so on and so forth with variable exponent of course very nasty okay so spaces so now let me take you back to the origin of these spaces okay so we go back here to 1931 uh, this is an article that was published by Orlich. Of course, the first few papers of Orlich were all in German, okay? And there he really talks about integrating a function with an exponent that is a variable exponent. So this object, uh, in fact, there were two objects that appeared in that famous paper. This one at the end of the paper uh, with an integral, in other words, the continuous case, and there is a discrete case that was at the beginning of the paper, okay? And same, same for Orlich. I mean, they, they had to deal with this problem. And remember, uh, at that time, the only B-type spaces, B-type meaning Banach spaces, because at that time they didn't call them Banach, they called them B-type. And uh, they were only these classical LP spaces with the Hilbert and so on and so forth. So it started there. I mean, the first ones. And really, we struggled, me and Osvaldo, to really make sure to go back to these articles because they were uh, written in German and uh, it was Osvaldo who uh, who knows German uh, who indeed cl uh, clarified this to me uh, that he used it that this variable exponent even almost like the word but anyway so uh, that was the case of 1931 uh, and then you have I see it here, typus B, vom typus B. Uh, this is this Banach spaces, and that appeared in a paper that was published in 1932. But now it's different. So uh, I want you to pay attention now. Huh? So this is now what happened in 1932. So what you have now is something different. Uh, let me uh, show you. Okay, here we are. So, uh, what you have now is a function. Uh, this is not uh, the function phi that you can see here. Um, you see it? Here, uh, you cannot catch the variable exponents with this, okay? There is no way you can do that. But what you can get is something more general that LP, in other words, to the power P, okay? So, uh, these spaces that you see right now, we call them in a our modern now terminology, Orlich spaces. Either you, you take uh, Orlich function spaces, okay, these are the Orlich function spaces, or Orlich uh, sequence spaces, uh, both of them, okay? So, but this one does not catch the example that appeared in 1931. So that's why it flew by and there was no uh, systematic study of that one. But this one, took over, uh, really, I mean, the, the case of all the space, there is a school, a Polish school uh, dedicated to this, as well as a certain Chinese uh, group in Harbin, with Chen Shutao, this is their specialty. Huh? Uh, Chen Shutao, of course, studies under Orlish in Poland, and his school is, uh, his group is fully dedicated to the study of Orlish spaces. And w w w some of you may wonder, what do I mean by that? So th the problem is, when you take LP, LP, classical LP, the norm is natural, which is the integral to, with the exponent inside to the power 1 over P. But when you take a function phi here, then the norm uh, is not given in a simple way from the integral. Uh, uh, we use this Minkowski functional uh, associated to a certain convex set and we generate a norm. Uh, uh, this norm now 
uh, in the modern terminology, we call it the Luxembourg norm, eh? because he studied this too, and uh, but it's basically the Minkowski function associated to the set that you see there, huh? okay? For which that integral is less or equal than one without lambda, without lambda. That is the convex set. So in any case, uh, this norm, as you can see, is not direct from the integral. And that is the difficulty of uh, studying the early spaces because the norm is not direct. It's very indirect. So for example, uh, if you look at the case of some geometric properties, I'm talking about uniform convexity, strict convexity, for example. In the case of capital LP, it is very smooth, very easy. Okay, from from the beginning, they were able to do it. Why? Because again, uh, the integral gives you the norm, basically. Huh? Huh? The norm to power p is the integral. But here, no, and that's why it's very difficult, extremely difficult. Okay, so. Uh, and this is a point that I, w I want to insist on it, huh? so that the norm is very much complicated. Now, if you look at uh, what happened after the 30s, 1950. So now, Mushilak got involved with Orlich, and they came up with uh, a definition that is more general than the Orlich spaces, and it captures the variable exponent spaces. Huh? So... Here is the way they did it. So they consider the function now of two variables, uh, one between zero and one, and the other one between zero and infinity. And they consider now the integral, but you have here, you see it, you have one variable here and the other variable here. Okay? So you can easily, uh, I, I will show you in the example how this example here of this function phi now of these two variables uh, will capture the uh, the variable response spaces. If you ignore the first variable x here, you get the classical orly spaces. You see? So this, this definition is more general. But again, same story. Uh, what is the norm? Okay? The norm is going to be, the Luxembourg norm is going to be, again, defined by the Minkowski functional, which is the infimal, etc., etc. So, the norm is very complicated. Okay? Great. So here is the example that I was telling you about the example of uh, the variable exponent spaces. And this shows you how you see the function phi xt is uh, t to the power p of x. Okay? And that's how you get uh, the variable exponent spaces as an example of this Mushilak Orlich uh, spaces. Okay? Great. So, now, the same year, 1950, Nagano wrote a book uh, that you see there uh, called Motorized Semi-Ordered Linear Spaces. It was published in 1950 in Japan. And I'm having, myself and Osvaldo are having major problem getting this copy. Uh, so, in 1950, Nakano, what Nakano did is something very, very profound. And uh, uh, he really... Uh, I was talking to Osvaldo two days ago, and I was telling him that if you look at, for example, the Banach contraction principle, okay, that says that if you have a contraction or a complete metric space, then you have one fixed point unique, and the interest will always converge to that unique fixed point. So we say it's Banach. It was published in his thesis in 1922, except that this theorem as is, is well known. It was well known before him. And so why do we call it Banach contraction principle? It's because what Banach did, which is really very profound, is that the examples, I mean, the theorem was known, but it was known in specific spaces. Like, for example, people trying to solve a differential equation, and they consider, let's say, uh, the space of continuous functions on an interval A, B, with the soup norm, and everybody knows it's a complete matrix space. And then they consider the differential equation. They have a, 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 a map that is no a contraction. And then they they came up with the iteration and it converged to the solution. So you see, the, 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 the theorem known uh, to us as Banach contraction principle, in fact, was discovered uh, before. Uh, so, hi, Sam. 
is joining us now. Good. Don't worry about it, Sam, because it's going to be re it's recorded. So I will send you the link and uh, as a YouTube style, and you can watch the beginning of the talk. Don't worry about it. So in any case, so uh, what 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 Banach saw is that uh, instead of having a theorem that is valid in some specific cases, he said, no, 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 no. Uh, uh, what you need, in fact, is just a metric space that is complete, contraction, and you have the conclusion, okay? So it's uh, this abstract formulation that, uh, that is very powerful, and it, it, it bears his name, but it's not just for the sake of uh, uh, the uh, love of abstraction. No, because right now, his abstraction is so powerful that it helps us understand some of the results in uh, some weird cases, like, for example, uh, as I told you before, if you take in logic programming or artificial intelligence and you are dealing with the program that is stratified, it has only one model, and they did not understand how, and not only that, that the model you can generate it uh, in a countable or omega steps. Uh, in fact, the model, uh, just for the sake of clarifying something simple, is that the model, that's what allows, for example, the queries to be answered true or false, uh, uh, associated to the program, of course. So, and they didn't understand. It was uh, Fitting who uh, published a beautiful paper saying, hey, this is a special case of uh, uh, Banach contraction principle. So you see, this abstraction uh, allows us to understand the theorem in its beautiful abstract form with the maybe more potential what applications. And that's what Nakano did. So what Nakano did, he went back to all this work. I'm talking about Orlish work, of course, as well as Mushilak. And he said, oh, uh, like what they did with the norm. Okay, so we have some simple examples. And now we have a vector space with a norm and we have the concept of normed vector spaces. So what you have here is, uh, is uh, a, a structure that is new, that the people did not know at that time. So he called this a modular, okay? So uh, a function that's defined on a vector space, x is a vector space, sorry, I should have put it there, and you have these properties, huh? so it's like a norm, so you have Row of x equals zero if and only if. If you have only uh, row of x, uh, row of zero equals zero, then you have what we call a uh, modular. But regular modular, if you have if and only if, only at x equals zero that you have row of x equals zero, like a norm or semi norm if you want. Okay? So, and then you don't have homogeneity, you have row of alpha x equal row of x every time that absolute value will modulus of alpha equal to one. You don't have uh, the triangle inequality, but you have that property three, okay? In fact, for the purpose of what I'm gonna be talking about today, I am not gonna be dealing with three. I'm gonna be dealing with convexity. I'm gonna assume that rho is convex, and that's what you have there, okay? So in other words, uh, it's, uh, 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 what you have there in three is weaker, of course, but, uh, I'm going to assume convexity. Right? Through what I'm going to be doing all over, I'm going to assume that rho is convex. So this, this appears in his book that was published in 1950, okay? And he called it a modular. So if you go back to the uh, variable exponent spaces, I think I talk about it here. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. Uh, a property that's very, very powerful property that you will hear a lot about when you are dealing with modular vector spaces is known as the delta two property, okay? And by the way, if rho is convex, it's very easy to see that uh, the function alpha that gives you uh, rho of alpha x uh, is uh, monotone increasing in alpha. So if you take alpha times x, alpha being real, of course, okay? It's increasing. So the delta two condition, okay, in fact, it's any number, you can remove two and put any number bigger than one. It's the same, okay? Uh, uh, don't, don't, don't look at it as something major, huh? the, the two. It's just what we call the modular conversions versus the norm conversions, okay? Uh, they can be different. But if you have delta two, then 
the uh, uh, modular structure or modular properties uh, of the space as well as the norm structure, of course I'm referring to the Luxembourg norm, are the same. So you see, it's very important here that the people will assume delta 2. You will see uh, 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 people who are publishing in this area, the, the, this property here is crucial for them because they always go back to the norm. And for them to go back and forth between the modular structure and the norm, you need the delta 2 condition. Okay? That's number one. Number two, when delta 2 fails, <coughs> then then it's bad. It's very nasty. It's extremely bad. Because, again, what does that mean, delta 2 fails? It means that rho of x, you see it, can be finite, but rho of 2x can be infinite. Uh, that's, it becomes bad, really bad, when delta 2 fails. So that's why uh, when you have a theorem uh, with delta 2, if somebody can remove delta 2, oh, it becomes extremely important. I, I, don't, I don't mean like uh, somebody will notice that the proof uh, in fact does not use what delta 2 no no i don't mean that i meant if you are able to show the validity of a result without delta 2 it becomes very powerful and i'm talking about the people working in this area again huh? because if you're working in normed vector spaces then you don't have a problem at all huh? that's not doesn't concern uh, you. This is the people working in this modular sense. So, now, uh, when you have a modular function space, I'm sorry, uh, not modular function space, I should have removed modular function space, I don't mean modular function space, I meant modular vector space. Oh, 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 oh. no, 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 it's, it's still correct. It's uh, modular, the, the row is the function, I'm sorry, the modular function row defined on a vector space x, we have a, a, a space that we call the modular space, x row, okay, on which we work, okay? So, and you have the norm, the Luxembourg norm, defined on x row, okay. It's just, you know, coming from, by the way, Nakano, all this was known to Nakano, huh? So here we are, um, where am I? Ha, huh. now I wanna take you back to 1931 again. The, this is how I got involved, to be honest with you. I was looking at this book. Uh, it's a beautiful book called History of Banach Spaces. Okay, beautiful book. Uh, something like six, seven hundred pages. And I saw this. And what, he doesn't talk too much in that book. He just tells you the evolution of the whole function analysis and the uh, Banach space theory. Uh, from a geometric point of view, uh, topological point of view, etc., etc. So he goes, he goes just, and this year was done this, this guy was done this, this guy did this, etc., etc. And there he talks about this space, okay, this one. And he says, he says there, I wish I can show it to you, in that book, that this example inspired Nakano. In his definition of modular vector spaces. Ah, now you got me interested. And again, uh, I would like to uh, say that it was uh, because I was pushed by Nasreen, who is uh, uh, a visiting scholar from Turkey, who was visiting me for a year, and she was the one who was pushing me to. And we're looking at this, and we found this together. So this point was crucial to be honest with you and uh, then I start looking at this space so first of all this is the example uh, that you find in the original paper of 1931 this is the example of I told you about uh, it was the discrete example uh, this is sequential space the other one was function space and this one is a uh, is a, and I want you to pay attention to the power uh, so it's power n okay great so when you have a power n, what happened now? So the lambda, what comes out is going to be lambda to the power n. I mean, absolute value of lambda. If lambda is positive, if it's real, then you have absolute value of lambda. But if lambda is positive, you're going to have lambda to the power n. So you see, this lambda to the power n, if lambda is bigger than 1, even if the xn 
is convergent with this n huh? in, in the space, when you multiply by 2, you may not be convergent. So meaning what? That it fails, delta 2. For this space, delta 2 fails. Okay? Great. So things start rolling now. Huh? So you have this space, you have the norm, and you have the module associated to this space. Same as the integral and is given by rho of x. x is a vector in capital X equal to this. Okay? Which is a module. This is totally different from the little LP spaces or capital LP spaces. The norm, you can only get it through the infimum, okay? And therefore, it's very complicated to evaluate, okay? Great. Uh, I believe I put it here uh, um, that X rho is in fact the whole space X. X rho is the whole space X. So we don't have this problem of X rho being smaller than X, okay? Great. So now, so now we want to extend it. Huh? Uh, not me, not me, uh, by no means. As you can see there, uh, this was done before even I was born. So uh, you can see that the people, they took the example for it was N. That was from Orlich. And what they did, uh, what his name, Nakano, did that, is that he replaced N by P of N. Okay, so now you have a variable exponent, but a real variable exponent. You have a function P, okay, like the uh, capital of, I mean, the functions with variable exponent, but I'm, I'm working with, uh, with the uh, sequential, the discrete case, huh? the discrete case. Huh? So uh, you can always put a measure, discrete measure on N, and you can see this as also a measure, measurable uh, space of measures but uh, I, I look at just a sequence let, let, let's let's not complicate the matter so you see this this now uh, appeared when 1951 in the famous book by Nakano and you have the module same the module but instead of having the power n you have the power p of n and it's a module and it's convex if p of n is bigger than one so it's convex okay then you have uh, the people uh, who wanted to study now the geometry and topological properties of this space. Okay? And this was done by many authors. It, it was initiated by Nakano, but it was done by many. Uh, I, I, the list is very long, and I couldn't put, it, put them all here, okay? Like uh, uh, the famous Klee uh, that uh, inspired Sandarisan. Uh, so Sandarisan did it because he wanted to correct a result from Klee. And the same paper was published in Studiamat in Poland, and it was false. There was a mistake in it, and Sandarisan corrected it. So anyway, so they were looking at, as you can see the title, Uniform Convexity of uh, Banach Spaces LPI. What's interesting here is that, uh, of course, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, the, 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 the last paper has nothing to do with uh, uniform convex, it has to do with topology, huh? reflexivity, and summability, okay? So anyway, uh, for these spaces, uh, and all the people who are working in variable exponent spaces, uh, there are two numbers that comes in uh, and are very important, which is P minus and P plus. If you are in the... Uh, the definition is almost similar, the discrete and the funk the, the, the continuous case huh? and the discrete case. Similar, but a little bit complicated, but similar, very similar, which is, uh, and also it depends on what you are doing. Sometimes if you're doing like reflexivity topological questions, then you don't need the whole infimum. You can just do a limit inf. You can allow few of them to be equal to some number, okay? And also to be bad. So the same with the soup. You can replace the soup by limb soup. Okay, but these numbers here, these two p minus and p plus, are very commonly used in the study of variable exponent spaces. Great. So now, what do we know? Some basic facts, very basic. I don't want to to bother with this. First, p plus. If p plus is finite, okay. Remember the the, the example by. Uh, by Orlich in 1931, P of N was equal to N, so P plus was equal to infinity. That's why we did not have delta 2. 
But here, okay, we can show that you, the space, this li uh, uh, little LP here, okay, ha uh, satisfies the module, satisfies delta 2 condition, okay, if and only if P plus is finite, okay? Great. Now, what happens if P minus is bigger than 1 and P plus is less than infinity, okay? Then the Luxembourg norm is uniformly convex. Well, you are in uniformly convex, then uh, you have uh, super reflexivity, reflexivity of the space, and therefore uh, uh, convex subsets, closed convex subsets, will be uh, will enjoy some beautiful uh, properties, including some kind of compactness. Remember the weak compactness. Okay. Um, now. So remember, huh? you need P minus bigger than 1, P plus less than infinity. I will say more about these two at the end, completely at the end. Great. So let's move on. Uh, so remember, as I said always, the Luxembourg norm is very complicated to evaluate because it's defined as the infimum. Okay? Great. So the module is natural, but not the norm. So now... Uh, what happened when p plus is equal to infinity? Once you assume that p plus is equal to infinity, it's a very, very, very terrible situation. Okay, you lose a lot of control. It becomes extremely nasty, and especially the people are working on PDEs in these variable exponent spaces. It's very bad. Okay, very bad. Some of these embeddings, you lose compactness, and it becomes extremely hard to solve. Uh, in fact, we don't even know where to start. So, and I, I showed you the original example of Orlich, P plus was equal to infinity, okay? So now we got, I got interested, okay? And let me before uh, show you, uh, let me tell you what is the modular uniform convexity that was introduced by Nakano, by the way, huh? uh, by Nakano, 1951. So, here is the definition, okay, it uses rho instead of the norm. If you replace rho by the norm, you get the classical uniform convexity in the space, okay? It's so just a, geom a geometrical property that allows us to do some beautiful stuff, okay? So, uh, what happened? We have this definition, so we say that rho is uniformly convex if this number, uh, delta, okay, is positive. We have delta r of epsi uh, and epsilon because it's not homogeneous. Huh? Rho is not homogeneous, and that's why you have this r. In the case of the norm, since the norm is homogeneous, you can take r equal to 1, and that's fine, but not here, okay? Great. So, uh, during our investigations, myself and Kozlovsky, when I started this 30 years ago, throughout our uh, research in the last 30 years, we we have this problem with, with delta. We don't have a control of delta, okay? That's not the case in the linear for, for the norm, but for the module, we have a problem. So, we came up with this concept called uh, UUC, as you can see here, which you have a control, a lower control of delta, okay? Great. So, uh, now, so what happened? So if you look at the spaces I just showed you, now this recent result I, I want to, to show you now. The recent result. Remember, the title was Introduction to Variable Exponents uh, Spaces and Some Recent Results. So now I want to show you the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, recent result. So here, you take uh, the infimum. You take the infimum uh, bigger than 1 less or equal than supremum, and uh, less than infinity. So if that's the case, then the natural modular uh, in LP is UUC. So you have this uniform convexity, modular uniform convexity. The UUC, huh? in other words, you have the, 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 the lower control, okay? If you have this. So what happened now when... <coughs> Supremum is equal to infinity. So you don't have the modular uniform convexity. I was interesting here, uh, looking at uh, th this stuff, uh, looking at the example 
the original example that starts with all this in 1931. So the supremum, P of N is equal to N, and the supremum is equal to infinity. Okay? So what happened? Nothing. For these people, unknown. Because we don't have the uh, uniform modular, the uniform convexity, the modular uniform convexity. So they don't know. They have absolutely no idea what to do. Okay? Now, let's go back to uh, my work with, uh, with uh, Kozlowski over the, the last 30 years. And I was looking at, uh, of course, I didn't uh, mention this before. It was looking at capital LP, okay? The classical capital LP. And I wanted to understand uh, the proof, the original proof, okay? The original proof of, uh, of the uniform convexity of capital LP spaces. And when I looked at him, I found out something amazing. So let me take you back. So here, I want to take you back here. So I noticed this, that if you look at the definition of uniform convexity in, uh, for the norm, they always take the norm of x minus y bigger than epsilon. Okay? But in fact, in fact, in the case of capital LP spaces, it's not uh, x minus y that appears in the calculations, the inequalities that they are using to prove that capital LP spaces are uniformly convex. That's not what appears there. What appears is over 2. You have x plus y over 2 and x minus y over 2. Ah, now we have something. Okay, here we are. So you see, it's the same definition. It's exactly the same, except what now? That instead of having x minus y, we have x minus y over 2. Again, keep in mind, is, is, some of you may wonder, how did you get over 2? Okay? Why not over 3? Why not over 10? Why over 2? It's because of capital LP spaces. When you look at the proof that capital LP spaces, they enjoy uniform convexity, and the inequalities, I'm talking about some of these famous inequalities, uh, like in the case of Hilbert, if you go back to Hilbert, the Pythagorean theorem, okay, is you have an x minus y over 2. It's interesting. You do not have x minus y. You have x minus y over 2, okay? And that's how we said, okay, wait, wait. Let us have now a new uniform convexity property, okay? And we called it, uh, we call this UC2 as well as UC2, as you can imagine, okay? But this time, the only difference, the only difference is that you have this over 2 instead of rho of x minus y. Great, fine. So, and then you have, of course, as I said, in a similar fashion, you have uh, the uh, UUC2. Okay, we call this, by the way, UUC1, but I didn't want to do it here in our book, as well in our publications, we call them UUC1 and this one UUC2. Okay, great. So now, obviously, because over 2 is less than the other one, so the UUC2, uh, if you have UUC, you have UUC2. Okay? So this is weaker. Huh? Because rho of 1 half x is less than rho of, uh, of x. So it's very easy to see that uh, this this version here is weaker than the UUC, okay? Okay, so as I said, <laughs> there, uh, this result explains our recent excitement, okay? I, I was really, I'll be honest with you guys, I'm getting old, but uh, sometimes I get excited. I really get excited. And this result got me excited. And again, as I said, thanks to Nesreen, uh, she's the one who pushed me in this direction. 
and we discovered something really amazing. So here we are. So now the space LP is UUC2 if and only if the infimum of the PN, so P minus, is greater than 1. Do you see it now? What did we gain? We gained that the P plus can be equal to what? To infinity. And if P plus is equal to infinity, we do not have delta 2. So as you can see, uh, 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 it's really uh, very important to see that uh, uh, the space from a, a modular point of view is bad, but we still have something there. The question becomes, okay, fine, but how useful is this? What, what, what can you uh, use this UUC2? How? Uh, what can you do with it, in other words, right? So here we move on. And in order to understand this, let me give you, this is old. This is, by the way, goes back to Nakano, not to me. Uh, Nakano, 1951, in his famous book. So you have this topology uh, or modular topology that really mimic the uh, classical metric topology. Uh, in other words, you have the modular convergence, the modular Cauchy, modular complete, close, compactness, and everything. And even the diameter in terms of... Uh, of uh, the, 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 the modular. Huh? Huh? So you have all these properties that's called modular topology and modular properties. Okay, so now, uh, now we are here. So what happened now? Consider a space LP and assume that the infimum of Pn is bigger than 1. If the infimum of Pn is bigger than 1, then you do have UUC2. But remember, you may have P plus equal to infinity, and therefore, you may fail delta 2 condition, and therefore, the space is very bad. I want you to pay attention to I. I is extremely important. Okay? Why? Because there, what does it say? It says, if you have a set C, which is non-empty, closed, convex subset of LP, and you have an X in LP, then you have this distance between X and C, right? Which is the infimum. In general, for the norm, it's finite. But because rho can take the value infinity, we have to assume that this distance is finite. We don't have to assume it for the norm, but we have to assume it for the modular. And now look at the conclusion, if you have the UC2. There exists a unique C in C, such that rho of X minus C is equal to this. Ah, now, let me take you back to, let's take, um, let's take uh, x equals zero. I want you, I, it's not in the slides, but I want you to say something here, just to get you interested, you know? Let's take x equals zero. Then what happened now? La, the distance from zero to c is equal to what? to the infimum of rho of 0 minus y, y in c. And that means rho of minus y. But we know from the properties of rho, rho of minus y, I'm looking at here, rho of minus y is rho of y. So basically what you are looking for here, okay, all this, is the infimum of rho of y when y belongs to c. And what it tells you, this theorem, is that there exists a unique C such that this infimum is equal to rho of C. Guess what? If you take the uh, Dirichlet energy problem, that's exactly what you are looking for. Because the, the integral is a module. That's the module, right, with the variable exponent. And you are looking at the infimum of rho when u belongs to a certain set. So you just need to have the correct assumption, okay, to have this to be able to conclude what you want. And of course, you have some kind of topology here uh, or compactness uh, if you have a decreasing sequence of convex sets with some correct assumptions here then the intersection is not empty. And by the way, you can prove for any family, not only for countable. I'm almost done. Let me just say something here. So I'm, I'm almost done. That's it. 
I only have one slide. I want just to say uh, that what we want, what, 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 first of all, the results you saw before are in the discrete case. But uh, we have proved it with the Osvaldo uh, in the continuous case, in the case of uh, functions, uh, spaces with variable exponents, functions, because that's where you study your PDEs, right? So, uh, again, keep in mind, uh, Osvaldo, uh, you can see here their books, a recent book on differential operators on spaces of variable integrability. Uh, it's a beautiful book, by the way. And Jan Lang and Osvaldo Mendez will be attending our workshop in December at KPUPM. Any questions?